My name is Julie Turney, and this is the HR Sound Off Podcast Show, the show created for HR and business professionals to discuss pertinent topics and trends as it relates to our professions. We're going to have amazing conversations with HR professionals from all over the world, get to learn their origin stories. How did they get into this profession? What do they love about being here? And how they want to set the record straight on that one misconception that really drives them crazy about our profession. Are you ready? I'm ready. Then let's sound off. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the HR Sound Off podcast show. My name is Julie Turney. I am your host. And today in the studio with me is Kim Freeman. We are going to have a very interesting discussion. I have been looking forward to this for the last couple of days since she scheduled it. So I want us to get right in. Kim, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. So let's get started. Tell us, what is your HR origin story? How did you get here? (laughs) Okay. While some people might have went from, you know, point A to point B, I sort of went from, you know, point A down to point H and then back again to point D and then, (laughs) then, you know, moved out to point S. Um, I did not start my career in HR. Uh, Originally, I wasn't even a lawyer as my first career. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent about 10 years as a journalist. I was a newspaper Mm -hmm. reporter, a magazine Mm -hmm. editor. I did a a lot of different uh, jobs in that sphere. And then I decided to go to law school. So I went to law school uh, after already being married. I I had a newborn and a toddler when I started. Uh huh. And then apparently I didn't think it was hard enough, so I had a third <laughs> baby while in law school. Oh wow! Uh, I can just say right here, uh, anyone listening, do, do not do it that way. But ultimately, <laughs> it's not not the path. Trust me on this. Not the path for you. Um, ultimately, through uh, I spent a few years in private practice, but I went in house. Okay. Uh, After about three years of private practice, Mm -hmm. I went Mm in-house. And it's not as if I went in-house to an HR position, but what I quickly found out was as an in-house attorney, you are the subject matter expert then for whomever is doing HR, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, despite the fact that I hadn't necessarily, you know, been practicing employment law, I you know, got myself uh, up to speed very right. quickly okay. on on compliance matters, on mm-hmm. best practices, you know, in helping the HR department with, you know, uh, performance improvement plans, terminations, right. and that sort of thing, the kind of everyday support mm-hmm. that an HR department could use. Mm-hmm. So I spent several years in-house in a legal capacity, and then about five years ago, I was working for a professional employer organization and uh, I was the general counsel and I I still, again, (laughs) had that same role, both Uh helping our in-house HR, but also being the uh, subject matter expert uh, for the HR uh, business partners that work for us who work with our clients. Okay. So at that time, now I'm, I'm really immersed. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a, HR deep now. Yes. <laughs> um, and a few years ago, the company was sold and the mm-hmm. uh, entity that bought it didn't have a model that, uh, where they had an outward facing HR department for the clients, mm-hmm. like, like we had already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, but they did have a general counsel. So it was like, we do not need two of you. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, they said, and I'm like, that's, that's that's make a choice, good. make a choice. Yeah, yeah well, like, this is not good. Um, fortunately for me, that they liked me, they understood I had a, a depth of experience uh, with HR, okay, and working with clients. So they said, hey, why don't you just become our director of HR services, build mm-hmm. out a team, and uh, just move into that position. Mm-hmm. So I did. Okay, and unfortunately 
hello, COVID. Yes. <laughs> so after oh. I had doing that for a few years, uh, COVID struck, uh, PEO it was one of the, you know, first industries to be hit very hard because our clients started to lay people off, right? right. And PEOs are typically paid on a per employee per month basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So fewer employees means fewer revenue. So after I had built out all of our COVID um, resources to help right. our clients, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, they could not sustain um, the level of help there at the PEO. So right. um, I was laid off as okay. part of that. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, I thought, okay, you know, I'm laid off. What am I going to do? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like millions of others, right? Like mm -hmm. panic. And I thought, oh, well, you know, no big deal. I have lots of experience. I have a law degree. You know, I'm still a practicing attorney. You know, I have all this HR knowledge. I'll just get another job. Right. <laughs> right. Easy peasy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, not easy, not peasy. Unpleasant was the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent many, many months uh, doing what I like to call the employment hokey pokey, where I had, <laughs> I love it, <laughs> one foot in um, sending resumes and yeah. interviewing and networking and one foot in the, you know, independent contractor world, because I still had to make a living, exactly. right? Like, yeah. you know, bills, the creditors, they're like, yeah, sorry about the pandemic, but so um, I was you know, just constantly, I felt like I was constantly working. Yeah. Because it's a job to get a job. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, of course, I'll go back to a corporation. This is typically what I've done. I've never worked for myself because mm -hmm. people are like, work for yourself, open your own thing. I'm like, who wants all that work? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do that. Uh -huh. I even wrote this big, long LinkedIn post about how, oh, you know, not all of us are entrepreneurs. Leave yep. us alone. Please. I saw, I remember. Right? That you remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I just hit the wall and I could not sustain it any longer. Right. And uh, finally something clicked and I said, you know what? I need to give something up here. And I decided I would give up the job search and embrace, um, I call it my pandemic pirouette. Yes. Embra <laughs> embrace. You have all these words. <laughs> <laughs> and just embrace, you know. And, and so I decided I would uh, put together an HR uh, consultant company. It's called Above the Rim HR. I love that. Uh, thank I you. I love that. It just sounds very basketball wives versus... <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, suits. <laughs> yeah, interest, you know, I, I thought like above the rim usually means, you know, you're playing at a very elite level, right? So mm -hmm. the elite level uh, HR consulting and I'm from Kentucky and a huge Kentucky Wildcats basketball, like you can't be from Kentucky and not be a UK fan. Oh, okay. Unless you're for Louisville and we won't talk about them. Oh, okay. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do that. No, no. So it kind of all fit, you mm -hmm. know, that I, I came up with this, but I still have my, uh, my law license is current. So I, I still do legal consulting as well, awesome. uh, especially in the employment and benefits area. Nice. Nice. You have such an amazing story, Kim. And, um, again, like, just as you mentioned, we came into contact through LinkedIn um, kudos to LinkedIn. I just feel like it's such a powerful space for professionals to actually meet. And I wanted to have this conversation with you because I felt like people needed to know your story. There are a lot of HR professionals out there who are in that space of trying to figure out what to do with their careers right now. Um, with COVID, with the experience of COVID, a lot of us are predominantly burned out like stressed to the max but just as you rightly said we've got bills to pay we still have commitments to our families and so on what advice would you give to HR professionals who find themselves 
in that similar situation to you. Now, the difference may be that some people might not have experienced that right away. Um, COVID came, they were still working, but now they're at that stage of like, okay, the business has said this is not sustainable and they want to start over. Or they're at the space where they're just burnt out and they've had enough and they want to make a shift. What advice would you give to our HR professionals listening right now? Well, I would say, you know, two things. Uh, first of all, you know, don't be in denial. Like, you don't, don't, if people say, how are you? You know, please tell them. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't have anyone you can tell, get an HR support network. Yep. get with other hr i belong to one here in central ohio it's mm -hmm. wonderful we get together periodically mm -hmm. either in real now in real life we can do that or virtually talk about issues um you know people will bring hey i have this going on what would you do what resources do you have so i would definitely say if you're in hr right now you absolutely should be part of a support network yeah period yes Having so, support yeah. is essential. I truly believe that whether it's your mentor or you find a group of people, I'm always sharing um, communities, amazing HR communities that I go to for support that I think are wonderful. Right. Um, and I, I truly believe that's important. I also believe like try therapy because that's useful as you're going through this downtime to kind right. of try and process everything that you've gone through for the last couple of months because you've been running on adrenaline right exactly. when that all settles you know just like if you were in a car accident you know when you get out if you get out alive sometimes that adrenaline rush hits once that's over then uh -huh. the injuries start to surface Right. Um, and so you don't want that to happen. Try to get help as soon as you can, right? I agree. It it really Find is community. fundamentally um, as 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 and we've seen this analogy a lot because it's true. Yeah. You you need to put your oxygen mask on first. Yeah. Right. Before you can help anyone else. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe a lot of people, fortunately, do lit. Uh, you know, work for companies that have EAP programs. Yeah. As an HR person, if you're telling others to go there, you should, you should be, be going, going there. there. <laughs> Thank you so much. So many times I ask HR professionals, like, do you have an employee assistance program? Yes. Do you use it? No, it's for the staff. Okay. Are you not part of the staff? Are you're you not pretty sure you're part of the like, staff? Did you check yourself? Like, <laughs> you know, you are an employee too. That EAP program is not just for the people that you work yeah. and serve. It's for exactly. you as well. Use it yeah. for goodness sake. Yeah. Pull, pull out that pay stuff. Yeah. Guess what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's your gift to you as well, huh? Yeah, uh, so, so um, yeah. I, I definitely think that that's probably the first thing, no matter if you're in a corporation or you're working on your own, uh, you know, as we are, that uh, you need to recognize that uh, you are suffering from the same stress uh, from the p pandemic. Maybe you're working from home mm -hmm. with, you know, and helping children learn and and the, uh, the par partner or spouse is working from home too. And there's yeah. this dynamic and you're trying not to get sick and all that. So you have all that stress. And then you have the additional layer of you're trying to help other people with that stress exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and to maintain um, their, their uh, employment so, so that the company keeps going so that, you know, hopefully everybody comes back to work mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and this is a lot. And I, I do believe that, um, you know, getting the resources that you need personally and then be able to share those with others, right? Yeah. Um, because there's, if you can say, uh, you know, like I understand, like, you know, HR is a lot about empathy, right? And it's like, I understand where you're at. I'm using the EAP program. I think it's, you know, it's absolutely helped me. Yes. So let's, let's get, let's get some assistance for, for you mm -hmm. as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I 100% endorse what you said. I agree with it wholeheartedly. It's something that I encourage um, HR professionals that enter that I talk to all the time. Like if you have an EAP, use it. 
And if you don't go get a therapist and also get a coach, because you should have both and, you know, to develop yourself as well, but to be the best you, like you can't be the best you on your own. You do need help. So get, get the right help. Um, Definitely. I got to agree with that, but you also, your journey is just such an intriguing one, Kim. Uh, being an attorney, taking that step while creating a family is not an easy feat. What were some of the things that you were able to benefit from to get the support that you needed to get you through your law degree? Uh, it's a, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's been a few decades now. I will say that if you can't tell from the um, no, I can't tell at all. Hair. Uh, but uh, it. And it's kind of like one of those things when you make it through, you go, I'm not really sure how I did that. Mm -hmm. Um, I did have some uh, limited help, right? uh, but I I went to school at night um, so I could be with my children during the day. Mm -hmm. Um, It was more of a mindset of this can be done. Yeah. Right. That um, there is a way even if it's not the preferred way Mm -hmm. (laughs) to multitask and study and um, also uh, attend to children and, and care for them in the, in the way that they need and deserve. Yeah. Um, I would say I just used, you know, nap time effectively. Uh uh (laughs) Um, And I was able to, you know, I had a few friends who, who would help out, uh, now and again, when I needed other study time. Right. I think I was able to handle it better because I had a previous career. Right. And, um, in that career, I wrote a lot, obviously Mm -hmm. as a journalist Journalist. major and, and then a journalist. So a lot of law school is writing and conveying yeah. things in a written manner. Mm-hmm. So I think I had maybe a, a step up on some people who didn't write a lot pre, yeah. pre, you know, prior to law school. Mm-hmm. So I would just say that um, very few things are impossible, right? Yeah. So making a plan and just knowing that, uh, you know, I was in my early to mid thirties and nighttime law school was four years of work because it was part-time program. Uh You know, I just said to myself, four years are going to go by anyway. Do you want to be a lawyer at the end or not? (laughs) Right. I mean, I can't stop stop those years from proceeding. So what am I going to do uh, during those four years? So I decided, I'm going to go to law school. This is mm-hmm. something I had always wanted to do. Uh, I come from a family of attorneys and I had kind of grown up in the law and uh, I said, it, it's kind of now or never. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just went for it. So I would encourage people that if you, if you've got a dream on simmer, you know, turn that heat up, let's get the boil going. <laughs> I love it. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm, definitely. I just love your spirit and your positive um, outlook on, on so many things. A lot of times we are going through different things in our life. And especially as women, as we look to make career pivots, like a lot of times you think you can't do certain things, but you truly have, you've made three pivots in your career professionally <laughs> while building a family. And you've just had that can do spirit about it. That's really something that is very admirable so thank you so much for sharing that I want to touch a little bit on what you were saying about organizations having in-house counsel because a lot of times I think especially here in the Caribbean if you're fortunate enough to have um, be in an organization where you have in-house counsel and HR that the in-house counsel just thinks they're there to do one specific thing what where the employer is concerned, which is create contracts or, you know, keep them out of lawsuits. 
but picking up compliance, the understanding of employment law and compliance regulations as it relates to employment law is a huge asset for attorneys. And I would just like to get your advice, um, any words of encouragement or advice that you have for organizations with in-house counsel, what would you have to say to in-house counsel that may be a bit one-sided in their thinking about their purpose in the organization versus their support to HR? Because also a lot of times as HR professionals, we know who our besties are in the organization, meaning the people we need to rely on to do our job successfully. So we know we need the CFO or we need finance because we, we need to, someone to help us interpret those financial statements. We know we need marketing to help us understand how we put you know, our personal, our professional brand out there and what it looks like, what it feels like. We know that we need legal um, from time to time because not all of us as HR professionals are legal experts. Like I had, I had a boss who once always used to say to me, Julie, we are HR lawyers talk to lawyers the minute an employee puts a lawyer in your face you pick up the phone you call the company call attorney, lawyer. <laughs> you call a lawyer and you say okay you talk to my lawyer so you you saying your people now you talk yeah. to my people yeah so what advice do you have okay. for in-house counsel that thinks that they can stay separate and distinct from hr <laughs> I, I would say that um not only are they kidding themselves but um, they're missing an opportunity to add value to the company mm -hmm. uh, as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. That even if compliance matters in the employment uh, uh, field or the you know either in house you know in their in house employment, even if right. they're not they're not um, uh, in charge of or responsible for compliance in that area they should at first they, they should be mm -hmm. but second they should still support hr and the hr department in that area because a lot of a, a company's risk comes from potential employment matters gone bad yeah. right yeah. Oh, <laughs> so yes. so if they if they want to really uh, stretch themselves and all and support their company um it, in-house lawyers should always be looking at being a business partner, right? So they have to, to balance business needs uh, versus mitigating risk and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and it's no different than, than anything else they're doing. You mentioned contracts, then, you know, that's always a big one yeah, or yeah. other compliance matters. You know, factories may have safety compliance and things like that but mm -hmm. it's it's the same thing for hr i i just can't stress enough <laughs> that if a, a person is in-house legal and there doesn't seem to be anybody in charge of the compliance of the hr department uh, that i i would just say you know go to somebody and say hey I, i'm going to take this on because this is important to our company um, it's it's important to employee engagement and yeah. retaining, uh, you know, attracting and retaining the best talent. Mm -hmm. You have to to be uh, cognizant of compliance matters, you know, because if if you're not a good employer in that area, people aren't going to want to come there to work. They're not going to exactly. want to stay once they get there. Yeah. You know, if if you're all over the board in terms of how you treat employees instead of, you know, the, the buzzword, as you know, for HR consistency, yeah. like if, you, <laughs> if you're not consistent, transparency. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to win the talent war. No. And right now, as we see, as we come out of this pandemic, what's happening, the, the, the market, you know, the job market is, is is rebounding to where it's now becoming an employee market versus mm -hmm. an employer market. Yeah. So if you're in house counsel and you don't have your eye there, uh, you need to turn and focus there. It also uh, provides an opportunity. I mean, look at my story, mm -hmm. right? I I didn't practice employment law before I went in in house, but every position that I had, no matter what the industry, and I've been in in several actually. I took on that role um, 
and it built, you know, it, it put tools into my toolbox mm -hmm. that later when somebody said, Hey, you know, there's been this merger and acquisition, which as general counsel, I helped them achieve, <laughs> but yeah. then they said, Hey, we already have one. What do you, you know, they were able to say, Oh, look, look, she has all these skills. She can just go over here. Exactly. And it's a very good marriage yeah. of when you have this background in law and, and you get the HR experience too. Mm -hmm. um, it gives you even more avenues. Absolutely. I think um, in the world of Agile, we call that a T-shaped employee. So yeah. multi-purpose, you can use you for different things. Um, that's great advice, Kim. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that advice goes both ways. So the same way for a legal towards HR, but also HR towards legal. I think that that's. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because when you have a subject matter expert in your company that you know you can depend on, mm -hmm. um, your skills as an HR professional grow too, right? Oh, yes. Oh, because yes. Um, obviously there's a, a line there that you don't cross you, mm -hmm. because you can't, you can't practice law without a license, no. and, you know, that sort of thing. But there is so much compliance uh, in the HR field because mm -hmm. of employment laws mm -hmm. and HR professionals need that support from legal, someone that yes. they can just go to. And, and the way I handled it with my team, all of whom were very experienced HR people, mm -hmm. um, if they came into me with an issue or something, they knew, like if you walk through my door, which was always open. Yeah. You need to have all the facts uh -huh. and you need to have po possible solutions. Like yeah. what do you think the right answer is? Exactly. And they could bounce all that off me and either, yeah, you're right on track or, Hey, have you thought about this or this or this? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Now that was, you know, it made for a very much a team atmosphere. They, they felt, you know, they were growing their skills Yeah. and they also, it would increase their confidence when working with the clients, you mm -hmm. know, they could, and if the clients were pushing back, they'd say, you know, we have ran this by mm -hmm. <laughs> legal, right? Yes. You know? yes. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Wish you and above the rim HR all the very best. Um, I hope that this pivot brings you great joy and happiness. Thank you so much for sharing. Tell us what you are reading, watching, listening to right now that you think other HR professionals would enjoy, whether that's personal or professional material. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say I, I'm a very voracious reader. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, reading. I, I just, I don't buy books anymore. I just have an app that is connected to the library. Oh, so, nice. so I just borrow, borrow books. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm probably way late to the party. I, I think I read the alchemist when I was very young uh -huh. and then lately it's been coming up a lot in posts on LinkedIn from people that I admire saying, you know, this book is, is very important to me and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, taught me a lot. So I just recently reread it okay. and I think it's a wonderful book about, uh, well, it's, it's kind of about goal setting, but it's also sort of a listen to your heart kind of book. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and it's a quick read, okay. but I think there's, there's definitely things in there, uh, about overcoming fear. And so a lot of it spoke to me in mm -hmm. terms of what I'm doing now. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, in turn, so that's, that's definitely something I would recommend. I do okay. a lot of just light reading too, of, yeah. you know, fiction and, uh, you know, fun reading, but, uh -huh. um, professionally, probably most of my time is spent on LinkedIn, Yeah, with, you know, following people like you and other HR professionals uh -huh. to get an insight into what they're doing, you know, what issues they have. And I just always recommend to someone in our industry, you need to be an active presence on LinkedIn Yeah, and you need to, to, um, uh, 
grow in your own knowledge, obviously, but uh, to have resources that you could reach out to. Yeah. You know, I'm on there. If you want to connect with me, that's great. If you want to pop into my, uh, you know, message box and say, what do you think about this situation? I'm certainly going to answer. Yeah. So, and, and every time I've done that to someone else, they've answered. Uh -huh. So growing a support network, yes. even through LinkedIn, I, I would say you need to do it. And, 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 and the last reason is because you don't know when it's your turn to get that surprising news, yeah. right? Um, oh, yeah. that you weren't expecting and just throws you back and you need a lifeline and LinkedIn can be that lifeline. For sure, for sure. Yeah. I am a true believer in the community that is LinkedIn and that I'm building on LinkedIn. And I would strongly recommend that for any HR professional, just even if you're, I'm an introvert. Like a lot of times people go, you're an introvert. I'm like, yes, I'm an introvert, but I just process things differently. Like, and I, I'll, I'll do stuff at the end of things that are very high impact for me. Like, doing this podcast or doing a live or, you know, a public speaking engagement or, you know, engaging with a client, especially if something they are sharing is very heavy. My retreat after that is very long. Um, and I have to do those things for my own self-preservation. So while you see me post on LinkedIn, um, or you see me in a, some other setting speaking about HR and what I'm passionate about in this space, I how I recover after that is very important to me. And I'm very I'm a very inward person. I'm a homebody. I'm not a party person at all. Yeah. Um. I'm just I'm a I'm just a homebody, and I am grateful that. I've had the opportunity to do a lot of things from the comfort of my home that I wouldn't have ordinarily before. And it's so funny because someone shared an article with me this morning on LinkedIn. Well, uh, someone from my network shared an article with me this morning that made me smile. It made me smile and it also made me sad. And the article was about people returning to work who are neurodiverse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the problem that you're going to have in getting those people to come back to work, they will go kicking and screaming because this has been the best, the best like possible. I've done so much that I probably wouldn't have done if the, if we weren't, if we didn't have a lockdown or all right. those other things that were put in forced on us to stay home. If I was still working a regular nine to nine, because there's no such thing as a nine to five in HR. If I was still working a regular nine to nine and beyond, I could not have published a book. I could mm -hmm. not have moved my podcast along. I could not have even thought about doing a LinkedIn live. Like there's so many things I could not have thought about doing. Right, right. It would have still been dreams in my head. They wouldn't have yeah. been things that I would have actually carried out because there's just no time. And, but yeah, I could see, I personally have made a commitment to myself that I'm not going back into the corporate space. I will support corporate any way that I can as a client, but mm -hmm. it won't be that I will be an employee of another organization ever again, other than HR at heart, which is mine. I think um, you 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 bring up a very good point too, and and trust me, I I, I agree with everything you just said about not working for someone again. Uh, but the the I wanted to circle back to people coming back to work or, mm -hmm. or being kicking and screaming, and this is going to be an issue that HR departments or you know HR of one mm -hmm. you probably will need legal support for yeah. because a lot of these people are going to come and ask for an accommodation, maybe pursuant to ADA. And, you know, the company's going to, nope, you need to be here. And they're going to go, well, wait a minute. We just proved I do not need to be here. Yeah. So there, there's going to be some very interesting uh, decisions uh -huh. coming out of EEOC, out of the courts about uh, whether employers can 
can bring people back, can deny accommodations uh, for remote work yeah. when they've already shown that, you know, there's probably not a business reason against them. Exactly. They're going to, they're not going to have a leg to stand on going forward. And especially for people who have a neurodiverse, um, right. who are, who are yeah. neurodiverse, it's going to be frankly, a problem. They should go, <laughs> here's the thing. And it's, it's hard to get companies to, to embrace this because you know, because they're like, well, this is how it is. And and then they go down this sort of slippery slope of, well, what about this? What about this? It's like, just, just focus here. Yeah. If you have someone who is neurodiverse, they, they need an ADA accommodation. You've seen that their work has been good for, mm -hmm. you know, 15, 16 months. They, mm -hmm. they're fine. Mm -hmm. What you what? need to let go. You, yeah. need, <laughs> you need to let go of the control Correct. and embrace the mm -hmm. fact that say, Hey, this is great, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I can have the diversity and inclusion and equity that I say I want by giving these accommodations. Absolutely. There's plenty of people I've talked to who are like, I don't want to be home anymore. I need my office to open. Yes. I'm done with this. Yes. <laughs> There are a lot of people like that. And you know, the funny thing is, despite my, despite my ADHD, despite my introversion, I did get to a stage earlier this year where I did miss like physically interacting with people. Yeah. But yeah. like, even as an introvert or someone with a neurodiversity, there comes a point where socialization helps us. Um, and when you recognize that for what it is, but like, I only need X amount of socialization a little bit. and Just then I can retreat much. back and I'm good to go. Yes. <laughs> then I'm good to go. Um, but what I, so what I have enjoyed doing, um, outside of working from home is sometimes I go to coffee shops and I work. Oh yeah. Or yeah. I go to rest co-working spaces and I work. Sure. Um, yeah. and that helps me a lot in terms of if I'm missing that specific set of interaction i'll go right. do that for a day and usually that's enough and that'll cover me for another year right. um, <laughs> um so uh, yeah uh, a lot of our fellow hr professionals are going to start to have or they already have i know this yeah. from my own hr uh, hr support network they're already having those very difficult conversations yes now yes. obviously for those who 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 would not be um, eligible for accommodation. It's, it's a hard conversation, but it's still, they have, a you know, the employer can, can do as the employer wants. Yeah. Um, so then it just becomes a very complicated and potentially risky conversation and decision mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, if there is a reasonable accommodation requested, right? Yes. So. Yeah, well, this is going to be very interesting. Kim, we have to keep our eyes on this. And I think that as certain cases come up, I would love to have another show with you. Oh, yeah. Where we yeah, just talk great. about sure. cases that we're seeing mm -hmm. globally and discuss them from an HR and legal perspective. Like, I feel like you're going to be, become my new compliance correspondent. Oh, good. For the good. I, I can it. do that. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Freeman reporting on compliance matters. <laughs> Oh, good. Love it. I got it. that in me. You know, I, that's my dual thing. Awesome. <laughs> so, Kim, I'm going to ask you the big question. What is one of the biggest misconceptions about HR that really bothers you, really gets you going, that people have about our profession that you want to set the record straight on right here, right now? What is that one thing that really bothers you when people say it? about HR is like, look, I got to lay all no, this is not, that's not the case. Okay. It, it has to be that HR is worthless. I, yeah. I, I get incensed when I see posts or comments on LinkedIn or any other social media platform yes. that I have to be on. That's just like, um, you know, they're saying they have a situation at work. And if you inquire, well, did you go to HR? HR is worthless. Mm -hmm. HR is not for employees. HR is this, HR is that, you know. HR has no power. Yeah, HR has no power. HR doesn't want to help. Yeah. HR is, is all for the company. Well, here's the deal. Um, first of all, it's just untrue. Mm -hmm. it, you know, there are professionals in HR that are there because they care about people. I mean, what is more important, you know, it's 
way up there, other, you know, your health, obviously, but what you do to make money to sustain your life yeah. is pretty far up there, right? Mm -hmm. So those, those people like us that have decided to be in HR are there to help you do that, right? To, yeah. to be an engaged, happy, productive employee, uh, so that you, you, the company benefits from the work that you supply, you benefit from the payment of wages so you can have a life, you know? So I just absolutely hate, and especially after the pandemic, it, it even, it, if I could get more incensed about it, I have been. Yeah. When, because I know what we've done mm -hmm. to hold that line for employees. Oh yeah. And, and 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 how much we've had to work in the overtime and the so you know and then not to get a word of gratitude just to be looked at like the enemy yeah i mean the truth of the yeah the, you know hr is part of your company just like finance and legal and whatever other department um so yes they're 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 part of the company and they want to try to keep the policies and so forth to make the company successful um, but you know, it's for people to be like, well, they're, they're not for employees. Well, of course they're for employees. Uh, they're an employee as we talked about earlier, exactly. they're an employee. They are employees. <laughs> Guess what? They're for management too, yeah. because they're, they're probably in charge of making sure that managers are trained and, and stay compliant. So, you know, every department, you don't hear that about any other department. No. Nope. Like, you know, finance is not for us. What, whatever, <laughs> this is not good. Yeah. So I would say that's my my number one thing that somehow HR is worthless. Yeah. Um, HR is is a, an extremely valuable part of any business, no matter what the size. And that's a focus of mine has been on small business. Uh, yeah. You may have read some of my stuff. I yeah. don't depend on default HR. Mm -hmm. Don't hand HR over to your receptionist nope. and say, oh, you can do HR. No, the person can't no. because they don't have the skill set to exactly. do it. And there's so many other things to consider, like compliance, mm -hmm. as we talked about earlier. Yep. So oh, yes. I, I think that people need to understand the value and worth of HR yes, and, um, you know, to, to keep those kind of ignorant opinions to themselves. To themselves. <laughs> I could not agree with you more. Thank you so much for taking your soapbox for us today. Uh, yes. Yes. I'm climbing off now. I could not, I could <laughs> not agree with you more. Like I wholeheartedly support, um, everything that you said. And I wish that, I hope it was always my hope that through this whole experience with COVID that employers would really leaders would recognize at the table the importance of HR being there and they'd also recognize the importance of giving HR allowing HR to use their voice while they're there in a way that really supports you know the entire benefit of the organization and it's still my hope that that will be the case, but I'm still hearing HR professionals talking about still fighting with, you know, their leadership with simple things like returning to work and making, you know, hybrid policies and those kind of things. But I think yeah. we're going to have a lot to talk about from a legal perspective as time goes on, Kim, for sure. I think you, you, you made a really good point about uh, HR should be at the leadership table if companies are out there and their HR uh, is not a part of senior management and leadership, they need to fix that. Absolutely. With quick, in the words and, of my, and, hus in and, the words of my husband, appropriately. yes, in the words right? of my husband, quick, <laughs> fast and with speed, fix it fast, fix it. Yes, fix I it. agree wholeheartedly. Thank you so much. This is a great conversation, Kim. Thank you. Can you tell our beautiful audience where they can find you on social media so they can connect with you? Absolutely. I have a website. It's just uh, www.abovetherimhr.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also find me on Facebook and Instagram okay. at Above the Rim HR. I'm on LinkedIn uh, under my own name, Kim mm -hmm. Freeman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd love 
all the connections. Please hit me up with the connections. Yeah. Connect the way. Start that's clicking. Right. I love Start it. Start clicking. Yeah. But, but that's how you can find me. Um, if you go to my website, there's a um, you know button to click if you'd like to schedule some time to speak to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to anyone about uh, these topics and any more they have on their mind. Awesome. That is so great. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much, Kim. Really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me today. And I wish you all the very best and every success going forward. And I look forward to building, continuing to build our friendship as well. Um, so Absolutely. don't be a stranger. Yeah, um, well, thank you for having me. It's been fun. Very welcome. Thank you for joining us in the sound booth today. I hope that you found this information from this episode useful. You can find me on all social media platforms at I am Julie Turney. That's I A M Julie Turney. And you can find this episode or this show on most digital platforms Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, you name it, we're there. Thanks, Dr. Solid Entertainment, for helping me to put this content together for you. And I will see you again in the next sound off.